Yes, this is Jenny. Yeah. Okay. You're starting at window five, is that right? Correct. Yes. Okay. Okay. Great. So it is 105 right now. Um, more people will be joining. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jenny Lewis Charles. I'm the patient education coordinator here at CINJ. And thank you for joining our men's webinar. Um, just a few housekeeping items. Your attendance today is completely private to other attendees. Um, no one will be able to see your face, your name, or any comments or questions will be only be seen by myself and the other speakers. Um, if you wish to ask a question, please type it in the chat box at the lower part of your screen or unmute and ask the questions at the end of both presentations. All questions will be answered at the end of both presentations. So our presentation this morning will be presented by Dr. David Columbus and Dr. Danielle Velez. So Dr. Columbus is a new doctor here at CINJ, and we're happy to have him. Um, he's the Associate Professor of Surgery um, for the Division of Urology. He specializes in urology oncology with a focus on prostate cancer. Um, we also have Dr. Velez, who is the Assistant Professor of Surgery for the Division Oncology, and she specializes in male infertility and sexual dysfunction. So Dr. Columbus, Dr. Velez, thank you for joining us this afternoon to discuss screening and early detection of prostate cancer and treatment options for erectile dysfunction and urinary incontinence after prostate cancer treatment. We're excited to hear about um, what you have to say, and I'll turn it over to you. Great, thanks. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? Perfect. Um, so yeah, I'm uh, Dr. David Galambos. I'm uh, new here, faculty on CINJ. I've uh, been out at Stony Brook in Long Island as a uh, surgeon there for about the last five and a half years. Um, so really happy that this opportunity came up. Um, born and raised in New Jersey. I grew up right around the corner in uh, Hillsborough uh, in Somerset County. So somewhat of a, a coming of home of sorts for me. Um, so this is really gonna be a, a two part talk. Uh, the first part will be by me and that's really kind of talking about, you know, screening and early detection of prostate cancer um, as well as a brief overview of treatment options. And then the second part of the talk will be by my colleague kind of talking about, you know, overcoming some of the potential side effects of some of those uh, treatment options. Um, so we'll go ahead and get started here. Uh, just give me a minute. I'm going to share my screen for the presentation. Great. Um, so we'll go ahead and get started. So what we're going to cover today, so uh, one, kind of a, a brief overview of prostate cancer facts and risk factors. Uh, two, kind of talk about why we screen for prostate cancer and what's the potential benefit. Um, three, kind of discuss overall general recommendations as far as screening goes. Um, and then finally, we'll talk about how if you were to be diagnosed, um, you know, what we call risk stratification and how that kind of dictates, you know, what treatment options are available. So starting, uh, you know, kind of very simple, what is a prostate? So a prostate is a gland that's found only in men. Um, it's quote unquote normal size, it's about walnut size. It's located between the bladder and the, the penis and sits in front of the rectum. So the urethra, which is the urinary tube, uh, runs right through the center of the prostate. So what this organ does is it actually secretes fluid that nourishes and protects sperm. And it has muscles within it that help expel semen during ejaculation. And so while it is prone to cancer and while unfortunately it can cause, you know, symptoms urinating, uh, you know, from both a benign and, and cancerous cause, it's, its main role is actually in fertility. So some facts about prostate cancer. So it's extremely common. Um, so it's the second leading cause of death in the United States besides lung. Um, it's estimated that almost 270,000 new diagnoses in 2022. Um, but thankfully, um, only about 35,000 deaths. So there's a huge discrepancy between, you know, number of diagnoses and actual people dying from prostate cancer, which, you know, kind of, again, is a testament to the importance of screening and early detection. Um, it is a diagnosis of aging. Uh, age is the biggest risk factor, which we'll touch about upon about. But um, the average age of diagnosis in the U.S. is 66 years old. About one in eight men during their lifetime will be diagnosed with prostate cancer. Um, but thankfully, only about one in 41 men will die of prostate cancer. 
And it's estimated that in the United States alone, there's somewhere between three and four million men who are living with prostate cancer today. So talking about risk factors. So unfortunately, unlike some you know, diseases or cancers, you know, there's not a ton of modifiable risk factors. And the risk factors are really things that you, know, you can't really control. So first and foremost, age. So prostate cancer is very rare under the age of 40. And almost two thirds of the cases are diagnosed by in men who are over the age of 65. Um, as far as uh, other risk factors, you know, race does, is a risk factor. Prostate cancer is more common in African American and Afro Caribbean men, um, and in this subset of males, it can be uh, it's, uh, present at earlier ages and can be more aggressive. Um, and then there's family history. So if you have a strong family history, specifically a brother or a father, you know, a first degree relative with prostate cancer, you know, your risk is about two times than the average man of developing prostate cancer, especially if that relative was diagnosed earlier in life, so before the age of 60. Um, and albeit rare, there are some inherited mutations, uh, such as the BRCA2 mutation, which you may have heard in the, in the realm of, of uh, breast cancer, um, but it is found uh, in some prostate cancers. Um, so if you also, if you have a strong family history of very early breast cancer um, or a known BRCA2 mutation within the family, that is another risk factor. So what are the symptoms? So usually nothing. Um, prostate cancer is usually found through screening um, because prostate cancer, especially early prostate cancer, usually does not present with signs or symptoms. Now, certainly men can have problems urinating and things like that, and that's very common as you get older, but that's not, that does not mean that there's cancer within the prostate. Um, so there are some things that can you know, be a little bit of a red flag. Um, these are usually advanced cancers, so either cancers that have spread throughout the prostate um, you know, very diffusely or have spread to other parts of the body. Again, although these are, these are less common to be, you know, your, your, uh, you know, insight into that there might be a problem, but, um, sudden onset problems, urinating, um, blood in the urine or the ejaculation, sudden onset, getting an erection, you know, it's normal as you age for your erectile function, your strength and caliber to decline a little bit, but, you know, going from very normal erections to having very difficult time getting an erection in a very short amount of time would be concerning. Um, and then signs that cancer has spread already to other parts of the body. So bone pain, specifically, you know, hips, back, spine, chest, things like that, or kind of weakness or numbness in the, in the legs or in the feet um, could be an indication of a, a spread of a cancer to the bones that are causing, you know, neurologic problems in the, in the spinal cord. Um, but again, most prostate cancer is asymptomatic and detected through screening. So what is screening? And screening are basically tests to look for diseases or health problems before there are any signs or symptoms. Um, and so they can help find problems early on before there are any symptoms. And that's often a benefit because if these, you know, if this process is detected early, it potentially is easier to treat and cure. So prostate cancer screening is really twofold. You know, one is a blood test called a PSA, and the other is a digital rectal exam or a prostate exam. So what is a PSA? So PSA stands for prostate-specific antigen. So it's a protein that's released by the prostate that circulates within the blood. Um, so this is a protein that's released by both benign and cancerous cells of the prostate gland. So back in the 80s, this test was actually used to monitor men who already had a known diagnosis of prostate cancer to see how they were responding to treatment. However, in the mid 90s, you know, that's when we kind of switched and used this for a, a screening test. Um, to kind of screen for the development of prostate cancer. Um, and there's clear evidence that this, you know, that there's a benefit to prostate cancer screening. There's a little bit of controversy around it, which I'll briefly touch upon later, but as you can see highlighted on these graphs, you know, around the mid nineties, when this test switched to start being used in asymptomatic men as a screening test, the number of deaths started to decrease and continue to decrease as well as the number of men who were presenting with metastatic disease, meaning presenting with disease that had already, you know, spread from the prostate to other parts of the bodies. So there's clear benefits to PSA as a screening test. Now, there is no quote unquote normal with a PSA. Um, and that's kind of one of the, the tricky things about it. You know, we, there are general kind of numbers that we would consider normal. Um, however, you know, what is normal or abnormal varies a lot based on age, based on race, based on the size of your prostate, 
And based on if you've had BSA values in the past that were dramatically different from what your numbers are now. So kind of general rules of thumb, the younger you are, the lower your PSA should be. You know, as you get older, we expect your prostate to grow in size a little bit. And so that's why, you know, a, a PSA of say two, for example, you know, in somebody who's, you know, 70 years old would be very normal versus somebody who's only 40 years old, you know, number of two is, is kind of pushing the upper limit. Um, and, and so these are numbers that we really take in, in context of a lot of different things. General rule of thumb that sometimes people keep in mind is below four. Um, certainly, you know, your, your PSA should always be in single digits for the most part, but as a, a general rule of thumb as a number to keep in the back of your mind, you know, less than four is, is likely to be, you know, on the normal end of the spectrum. And then the other part of screening is a digital rectal exam. So that's when a, you know, a physician puts in a, a lubricated glove into the rectum to feel the prostate. Um, and this is important because there is a small amount of prostate cancer where the PSA does not rise to the level that you would expect it to. So there is some circumstances where somebody could have a, a relatively normal PSA or a PSA that's only slightly enlarged, but you know, a, a rectal exam could raise concerns that there might be something going on that we need to detect. So just to kind of, again, briefly touch, why is there a, a controversy, you know, kind of around PSA and, and prostate cancer screening? Um, and, and there's kind of two main things. So one, PSA is good test. It's not a great test. Uh, you know, it, the problem with a PSA is it can give false positive or false negative results. You know, what that means is somebody could have a PSA that's elevated, that is just due to size or inflammation or things like that. And so they could have a high PSA and not have prostate cancer. And the corollary is also true where you can have a relatively normal PSA and still have cancer within the prostate. So there's inherently some flaws within the test itself. Um, and then also, you know, historically, you know, the way we treated prostate cancer is much different than we think about it and treat it now. So previously there was some criticisms where we're, you know, too much screening, too aggressive with, you know, who that needs to have a biopsy and then potentially too aggressive with treatment has led to some men, you know, historically being what we would call over-treatment. Um, and that kind of, you know, cascade of events all starts with screening. So those are kind of the, the two, you know, blowbacks a little bit as far as screening goes. But, you know, I think as a, as a community, you know, especially within neurological oncology, you know, one, um, we're a lot, you know, more careful and smart about, you know, what numbers warrant further workup. We also have a lot of other tests that we use now before going right to a biopsy, um, such as other urinary or blood, what are called biomarkers, and also advanced imaging, such as MRI. So one, we're a lot more careful about, you know, who might actually need to, you know, undergo a biopsy. And then two, we're also a lot more careful and, and thoughtful and have a better understanding of the disease about who actually needs to be treated. Um, we'll touch about this too, but there are some prostate cancer that even if diagnosed, we think that it's so, you know, indolent, meaning slow growing and not aggressive that we don't even treat all of these cancers right off the bat. So we're a lot more, you know, understanding of the disease and a lot more thoughtful about, you know, who needs to be treated and when. So there's a lot of different screening recommendations based on the various organizations. You know, as a general rule, I think the, the biggest benefit to prostate cancer screening is really between about the ages of 50 and 65. Um, you know, all of our guidelines suggest shared decision making. So, you know, this is these kind of conversations are, are things that you can have, you know, either through a urologist or through your primary doctor about, you know, should I screen for prostate cancer? Am I at risk? You know, and, and what are really the benefits? But Generally speaking, men who are around the age of 50, your average risk man, no significant risk factors is really when you should start having the conversation about, you know, whether screening is right for me. Um, in people with risk factors, that, that number goes up, or sorry, that, that number goes down, meaning, you know, around the ages of 40 or 45 is really where you might want to start to consider screening, you know, either with a, you know, with a PSA and, and a rectal exam. So, Again, just so we're clear, those are the, the exam and the PSA are screening tests. Neither of those tests alone can diagnose prostate cancer. The way prostate cancer is actually diagnosed is through a biopsy, as most cancer is diagnosed. Um, so this is a biopsy that's done by a urologist, um, and it's usually either done in an office setting or in an ambulatory kind of surgery center setting. 
um, where basically a needle is passed into the prostate to get a uh, tissue sample from different locations to actually see whether there is cancer, yes or no. And if there is cancer, the biopsy is not just going to say yes, no, it would give you, give us, you know, a lot of information about what exactly we're dealing with. So, you know, it would give us what's most important in these discussions would be really the, the stage and the, and the grade of cancer. Um, and whenever you're talking about prostate cancer, one thing you'll always hear or one thing to keep in mind is, is what's called a Gleason score or a Gleason grade. And what those, what that is, is that's the way that the pathologist is describing how aggressive or lack there of the, the cancer looks. Um, so higher numbers are more aggressive, lower numbers are less aggressive. The way we previously reported this was a scale that basically went from a six to a 10, that was called the Gleason score. Uh, we've kind of changed the way that we talk about it now in terms of these Gleason, what are called grade groups. Uh, these grade groups go from a one to a five. So generally speaking, though, lower numbers, less aggressive, higher numbers, more aggressive. And really these grade groups, again, the way we kind of talk about them in this day and age is a grading scale that goes from a one to a five. So these are a couple of kind of, you know, this is a busy slide here, but this is what we kind of look at and think about, you know, when an individual is diagnosed with prostate cancer to kind of, you know, what we call one, risk stratify the cancer, and then two, you know, kind of lay out treatment options based on that risk stratification. So not to go into this in too much detail, but, you know, kind of a simplified version is there's low risk, intermediate risk, and high risk prostate cancer. And the things that put you really into these risk categories are, again, that Gleason grade group, what your exam might show, what any imaging might show, and what your uh, PSA is. So those are all things that are used to really put you into these risk categories. And then these risk categories are really what shape treatment options. So kind of starting with low risk prostate cancer. So, you know, these are the prostate cancers that we really believe, at least at that point in time, are ones that are very unlikely to, to grow, spread, cause you any symptoms, and really pose very little risk. Um, so these are your indolent cancers. These are your, I think I have a slide here next, but, you know, for these types of cancers, really active surveillance is encouraged and really being promoted by more and more of our you know, the cancer societies as something that should really be considered as a treatment strategy for low risk prostate cancer. So what do we mean by low risk? So this is a small tumor that's limited to the prostate. We believe that it's inherently slow growing. And we believe that this is not an aggressive prostate cancer. Again, and that's, that's being driven by the biopsy results showing that it's low risk, your PSA being less than 10, and nothing on an MRI or other imaging to suggest that there's really anything, you know, higher volume disease or, or spread outside of the prostate. So in these men, active surveillance is, is a really good option. And as you can kind of see here in the bottom right of the slide, almost 60% of men in the United States now who are diagnosed with low risk prostate cancer initially elect for active surveillance. You know, an active surveillance is not a strategy of kind of, you know, getting a diagnosis and saying, hey, this is nothing you need to worry about. We don't ever need to think about it. it it's a monitoring process um, because the whole thought process is that, you know, a good amount of these cancers are not going to grow or change or cause you a problem, but some of them will, depending on what, you know, what point we diagnose it. And so we do need to keep an eye on it and jump in and kind of change our strategy from watching it to treating it if the cancer is showing that this is something that does need to be treated. So how do we do that? You know, the mainstay is with PSA blood tests. We get them about every six months. We want to make sure that number is kind of, you know, hopefully staying level and not going up significantly every time we check it. We do exams of the prostate from time to time. Uh, oftentimes we will get MRIs from time to time. That's probably the best imaging test that we have to really, you know, look at what's going on within the prostate. And it does require biopsies from time to time because a biopsy is really the only way that we can tell for sure if things are changing and we need to change our strategy. So if a man is placed on active surveillance, usually about a year after that diagnosis, he gets another biopsy. And if nothing has changed, he stays on active surveillance. And then every couple of years, we do another biopsy. You know, again, we really do need to, from a 360 degree, you know, treatment plan, keep an eye on everything to make sure, you know, we're not missing a window where we need to jump in and, and treat it. 
So this is a very busy slide, but essentially what this is just kind of highlighting is for you know, prostate cancer that is not low risk, which we call more kind of quote unquote clinically significant cancer, um, there is a ton of treatment options. Um, and all of them really revolve around either some form of surgery or some form of radiation. Um, but there are a lot of, you know, different ways that prostate cancer can be, you know, treated. Um, some of it is based on the individual cancer itself. Some of it is based on the individual patient itself. So, you know, it's a very patient-centric discussion. It's a very individualized answer about how we might go about, you know, treating cancer if diagnosed, if it's not one that's safe to just watch. So one option is surgery. So most of these surgeries, about 90% of prostatectomies in the United States these days are done by what's called robotic surgery. Now, just to be clear, robotic surgery is not artificial intelligence surgery or, you know, kind of remote tele telesurgery. I mean, it's basically very advanced, what's called laparoscopic surgery, which is camera-based surgery. Um, so the gist of the surgery is you got to remove the prostate. So what it does is it enables us to do that through multiple small incisions, which are usually either dime or nickel-sized incisions. The robotic platform basically lets us to look inside the body during the surgery at 10 times magnification, three dimension, and high definition. Um, and it uses these instruments that have basically the ability to rotate at you know, more degrees of freedom and have greater you know, rotational capacity than the human hand. So it allows you know, us to use very small and very precise movements inside of the body. And while robotic surgery is used for a bunch of different surgeries, for prostate surgery in particular, it, it's great um, because the prostate lies deep down within the, what's called the pelvis. And kind of as you see on this you know, schematic on the left here, you know, it's, it's a very difficult part of the body to reach. So you know, robotic surgery allows us to you know, get down to where the prostate is, through very small incisions. Um, and kind of on the right here, it's just highlighting the overall gist of the surgery, which is basically removal of the prostate, sewing the urethra back to the bladder, bridging the gap of where the prostate was, and trying our best to spare the nerves, which kind of hug the sides of the prostate as they course, you know, towards the penis. Um, and so this, you know, the, the vision and the access that robotic surgery allows us is, is really great for those things. Um, because, you know, these are kind of cartoon, you know, uh, drawings here, but kind of highlight, you know, what we're talking about from the left here, those nerves that control the prostate, uh, sorry, control erections are really hugging the side of the prostate. So, you know, the robotic platform allows us to kind of get down deep into the body and have really great vision and very precise movements. Um, and then similarly on the right is highlighting what we call the anastomosis. That's basically the sewing of the bladder, uh, which is at the six o'clock position, back to the urethra, which is at the 12 o'clock position. And the robotic platform allows us to do that with very, very precise and very exact motion. Um, so, and then this is kind of just a, a drawing of, of these small, in, uh, sorry, a photograph of these small incisions, usually about four or five of them um, that heal up very well. Um, <clears throat> and this is a surgery that a lot of, a lot of men leave the hospital the day after. Um, and so the robotic platform allows us to do the surgery, one with much shorter hospitalizations, much less pain afterwards, very, very low need for blood transfusions or risk of bleeding, and overall a very fast recovery. And um, so outside of surgery, radiation is also a very good option for prostate cancer. Um, you know, there are some men who are at high risk for surgery based on, you know, heart disease, lung disease, things along those lines. Um, but there are also just, you know, other reasons why one might choose radiation as opposed to surgery. Um, so what, what radiation does in general is it uses high energy to basically kill cells within the cancer cells within the prostate while using, sorry, while leaving the prostate in place. So this is an outpatient treatment. So what that means is there's usually no hospitalization uh, associated with it. Um, and the treatment can go anywhere from, you know, one week to several weeks. And that's really based on radiation techniques. Um, so generally speaking, there's two main categories of radiation. There's external beam radiation and brachytherapy. External beam radiation is basically, you know, x-rays that are being delivered from the outside to the inside of the body. Um, brachytherapy is where radiation is either put into the 
uh, prostate either by seeds, uh, which is what's called low dose radiation, uh, sorry, or um, low dose rate, or where uh, essentially um, other the other way, which is called HDR brachytherapy, is where uh, basically uh, rods are put temporarily inside of the prostate via procedure that delivers radiation to the prostate, and those are then removed. As far as external beam radiation, you know, that's really where the variability as far as time comes into place. Your traditional very low dose radiation are these very short in and out sessions, you know, kind of 10, 15 minute sessions, but it's about four to six weeks to kind of get you up to the total dose that you need. Um, there are newer techniques that basically allow this, um, you know, the radiation to be delivered. Um, over about one to two weeks. Um, that's kind of your quote unquote cybernite or what's called SBRT radiation. Um, those are higher doses being delivered each time. Um, so each session is longer, takes more planning, often uses MRI guidance because you really need to be as exact as possible when you're delivering these higher doses. But the higher doses can potentially allow you to be done in about one and a half to two weeks. So generally speaking, both surgery and radiation are very highly effective treatments for, for localized prostate cancer. Um, there are a million and one reasons why one might choose one versus another, which is for a talk for another day, but they are both highly effective. So in conclusion, the risk of prostate cancer certainly increases with age. That's the biggest risk factor. Most prostate cancer is detected through screening in asymptomatic men, highlighting the importance. Uh, most men should begin talking to their healthcare provider about screening around the age of 45 to 50. Again, sometimes a little bit even earlier than that, depending on risk factors. Uh, neither of those tests alone diagnoses prostate cancer. It needs to be done with a biopsy. That biopsy will give us the stage and the grade that really kind of highlights treatment options. Not all prostate cancer, even if detected, needs immediate treatment. And again, what we talked about active surveillance should be considered in most men who have low risk disease. And surgery and radiation are both safe and effective treatment options for prostate cancer. Um, however, uh, as with any treatment, even though they are safe and effective, they do potentially have side effects. Um, thankfully, if side effects were to occur, we have very effective treatments for them, which you know, my colleague is gonna kind of highlight upon uh, momentarily. Um, and so with that, I will kind of uh, pass the presentation on to her. And uh, thank you for the time and the opportunity to speak with you today. Okay, thanks, Dr. Columbus. That was a great talk. Um, so hi, everybody. I'm Dr. Velez. I'm uh, Dr. Columbus's counterpart at CINJ. So I see a lot of our patients after their different types of cancer treatments. You know, it doesn't have to just be prostate cancer. Um, but certainly for you guys today, talking a lot about some of the after effects of prostate cancer treatment, whether it's radiation, cyber knife, um, prostatectomy, any combination of all of the above. Um, let's see. Hopefully you can all see that screen. And I'll change it to presentation mode. Yes, you're good. Perfect. All right. So like I said, I'm Dr. Velez. I'm here at Robert Wood Johnson Rutgers through the Cancer Institute of, Tech um, of New Jersey. Uh, homegrown. I went here from medical school a very long time ago now, um, but left for a little bit to go up to Rhode Island to do my residency and then did a, a little bit of additional training in infertility and sexual health up at uh, UIC in Chicago. And now here to talk a lot about rehabilitation for patients after their prostate cancer treatments. I think the biggest takeaways I'd love to give you for today are that it is normal to have some difficulty with erections and sexual health, um, as well as urinary continence, so urinary control after any of these prostate cancer treatments. Um, and that's really why I have a job here. It's to help you guys get through that and to get back to a baseline where we can help you to have the sex life that you wanna have and also help you get back to urinary control as well. We have a lot of options. So, you know, backing up, erectile dysfunction is really the inability to achieve or maintain an erection that's firm enough to have sexual intercourse. Like our goal is for you to be able to have penetrative intercourse. And it can be really be very, very common. As you saw from Dr. Glomos's talk, the prostate is this gland that's really nestled into the base of your pelvis and the nerves that control the erections are right alongside that prostate. 
So you can see that highlighted on this um, image here on the bottom right. And they might be injured during prostate cancer treatment. Certainly with radiation, they live right there. They're gonna be um, susceptible to some of, the, some of the scatter effects of the radiation. During a prostatectomy, even with the robot, you know, we can do a much better job of identifying and peeling away those nerves, but they're still going to take a little bit of a bruising during the operation, in which case patients can experience some temporary loss of erections, and that could last for a couple of months. That might happen for up to two years after treatment. Um, when we look back at um, rates of erectile dysfunction after prostatectomy, so surgery versus radiation. On the left-hand side, you can see this chart where, you know, if we don't spare the nerves, so if we blow through and we cut them all in the sake of, for the sake of cancer control, um, about a third of patients may still describe some erectile function afterwards. But if you slide your eyes to the right, you look at unilateral nerve sparing. So let's say that Dr. Glomos is in the operation and says, you know, on the biopsy, there was no disease on the right-hand side. So I can really spare those right-hand nerves, but maybe we have to take the left-hand side to make sure that we get all the cancer. When we look back at those patients, about 50% say that no, they can still get some erectile function or perhaps even great erectile function, um, you know, six to 18 months after their surgeries. And if we can spare both the nerves, that really optimizes patients to be able to have fairly normal erectile function about two and three times. Um, I like to think of surgery as, you know, all the damage sort of happens up front, and then patients have their lifetime to improve and to get better back to a new baseline. On the contrary, when we look at radiation, you kind of have to uh, think of the, the inverse. So you're getting little micro doses of radiation, a little micro doses of trauma, but even after the radiation happens, when patients look back five, six, seven years later, they sort of see accumulative effects and that injury to the erections um, continues. So if you look at the percent change in erectile dysfunction, you see that upward trend um, in follow-up time over an 80 month period, more patients are coming back with more erectile dysfunction as they get farther and farther from their radiation. So it's a little bit of a difference where you have a little micro traumas and micro injury that happens over a longer period of time. So again, you know, typically we're seeing patients who their erectile function will improve over two years after surgery, but it typically declines over time after radiation therapy. And really the best predictor of how things will look after you're done with your treatment is, well, how are things at baseline? You know, if, if, if you don't have great erections before treatment, we're not going to make that better after treatment. But certainly my job is try to get you back to a good baseline and get you back to that goal of being able to be sexually intimate with your partners. And that's the whole purpose of our penile rehabilitation program here at CINJ. We want to maximize the likelihood that patients can return to their pre-op erectile function level. And also secondarily, we want to make sure, make sure that you can maintain your penis size during that recovery period. Something that a lot of our um, patients don't recognize is that it is a little bit of a use it or lose it strategy. You know, if you're not getting nighttime erections, the average man is going to have four to six erections in the middle of the night and have no idea because it happens while you're sleeping. But if you don't get those erections during the nighttime, during the daytime, you're not getting that cyclic expansion and contraction of the tissue, which means it's going to start to contract. Um, on average, we can see some patients lose as much as two and a half centimeters sometimes after, after prostate cancer treatment. So the purpose of rehabilitation is while we're waiting for those nerves to recover, you're still getting blood flow down to the penis. You're still getting some kind of an erection, even with medication to help maintain your sex life, but also to help maintain your penile anatomy. And what we found over the last couple of years is that Patients who go to a dedicated penile rehabilitation program are much more likely to get back to their baseline sexual function. So recovery up to 75% of their baseline function um, if when they participate in a rehabilitation program compared to when you don't. There are a lot of treatment options for penile rehab. So the most common uh, tools in my arsenal are the oral medications and also a vacuum erectile devices, which is exactly what it sounds like. Um, it's a cylinder that you buy online or you can buy it in any sex shop, any medical device shop. 
And they're meant to basically bring forced blood flow, forced blood flow into the penis and help stretch out that tissue. So it mimics a natural erection and it just helps to maintain that elasticity. I have patients use these vacuum pumps two or three times per week, five minutes a day. And you can also combine it with a constriction band, which helps to trap the blood in the penis and helps with maintenance of the erection. I also have patients start oral medications, so really common ones, Tadalafil, which is the uh, generic form of Cialis, Sildenafil is the generic form of Viagra, Vardenafil, generic form of Levitra, and then a newer one called Avanafil, um, which is the generic form of Stendra. The goal of all of these medications are very, very similar. And um, their goal is really to help bring extra blood flow to the penis, which just means more nutrients, oxygen, food for the uh, penis, maintain that tissue integrity. And then also higher doses on top of maintenance doses to help you get erections. If we find that those oral pills aren't working, that they're not effective, we can add in injections, um, which is a much more localized, much stronger therapy. So if you think of the pills as sort of washing over your whole body, the injection is localized, stays in the penis, and it's much stronger. Um, obviously a little bit more uncomfortable, not as spontaneous, a little more cumbersome. So not typically the first thing that I'll go for patients. But there are a lot of different formulations of injections. The most common ones that we see are Trimix, Bimix, and Edex. They're available from different pharmacies, specialty compounding pharmacies. And typically when we're getting to the point of needing injections for erections, I'm having patients bring that into the office so that you can see exactly how we draw it up, where it's safe to inject. And we even do like a small test dose in the office so you can see how that feels in the safety of the office before you try to do it at home. Uh, for patients who are like, there's no way you're coming anywhere near my penis with an injection, I totally understand. Uh, the next sort of option would be a urethral suppository where you're basically taking a little gel and squirting it backwards into the penis um, so that it can diffuse into the, into the erectile tissues locally. So again, it, it's not going to be as strong as an injection, but certainly a little bit more comfortable. For the patient who, you know, we go through the penile rehabilitation program, we give them an appropriate amount of time to recover that erectile function. And what is that appropriate amount of time? For some people, it might be eight to 12 months. For some people, they might want to wait the full two years. But regardless, when we get to that point where you say, you know what, it's been a long time since my treatment, my erections are not getting any better. I am still not able to have the, you know, sexual intimacy of my partner that I want. We do have another option, which is the PL implant. And this is surgery. And I like to think of this as sort of a one way ladder or a one way street. The PL implant can be an incredibly helpful thing for couples and patients to get back to where they want to be sexually. But once we put that implant in, we can't go backwards. We can't go backwards to the medications or the gels or the injections. So I really like patients to have either tried or at least strongly considered all of these other options before we get to the point of implant. But I will say that once I get patients to that point, they are very, very happy. There's a very high satisfaction rate with our PL implants. There are two main types. There's an inflatable and then there's a malleable. Um, the malleable, as you can see on the right-hand side of the screen, it's it has this uh, nitinol core. So it's a very firm core that basically allows the penis to be rigid all the time. And then it's surrounded by this like fo foamy sponge substance that allows some malleability to it. So when you want to have sex, you bend the penis up. And then when you're not having sex, you can bend it down and tuck it down the pants leg. So that's not obvious. Um, this is a great operation. It's a great result. Um, typically the average patient who's opting for the malleable implant is somebody who doesn't have great hand dexterity. So they might have trouble operating the three piece inflatable implant on the left-hand side of the screen. Um, or it might be somebody who, you know, is um, has really tough to control diabetes. Um, those are the patients where you might be at a little bit of a higher risk of an infection from surgery. And so we may opt for the malleable because that has a lower risk of getting infected. But by far and away, I think the more common operation for the average patient is the inflatable penile prosthesis, or sometimes we shorten it down to an IPP. Um, this Everything is inside of the body. So no one is going to know that this implant is there but you. 
Um, typically, we're putting these in with a single incision right above or right below the penis. Patients spend one night in the hospital and they go home the next day. And two weeks later, you come back to see me um, in recovery so that we can check on the incision. We learn how to inflate and deflate the implant. And then patients practice cycling that implant every day until the six week mark. And at that point, you come back and see me again. Patients are usually fully healed and they can go on and have you know, as, as much sexual activity as they'd like. Um, I mentioned very briefly the risk of infection. You know, it, With any surgery, there's always a couple of risks that go along with it. Um, risk of bleeding, risk of infection, risk of injuring surrounding organs like the bladder, rectum, bigger blood vessels, the testicles. I'd say all of those things are a very low likelihood, less than three to 5%. Um, and certainly here at Robert Wood, we do a lot of these implants. So, um, you know, we, we, see, we see it all. Uh, on this next slide, I just want to show you guys a video to better um, understand what these implants look like. I'll fast forward. Again, you know, the implant is in yellow. And that's actually what it really looks like in real life. It, it's surrounded by this antibiotic coating to keep the implant clean and minimize that risk of infection. But I'll back up one more time. And you can basically see everything is inside the body. The pump lives inside of the scrotum in between the testicles. And when this patient is ready to have sex, he's going to squeeze that pump in the scrotum through the skin. And that's going to draw fluid, which is really just salt water, from the reservoir, which is a balloon. And that reservoir sits next to your bladder. You won't feel that. And it pulls the fluid from the bladder, for, from the reservoir, into the cylinders that live inside the penis. Okay. The goal of this implant is just to give you a firm penis. It's allow you to have sex. It's not going to change your interest in sex or what you feel during sex. It won't change your ability to have an orgasm. Um, most of the time when patients are getting this implant, they don't have a prostate anymore, um, in which case you're not going to ejaculate. So there's when you have an orgasm, fluid isn't gonna come shooting forward because there's no more prostate there. And you can see that when the uh, patient is done having the erection, there's a little release valve on the top part of that pump that they hit. And then it sucks the fluid out of the cylinders and back into the reservoir. Okay, so you can see that it comes all the way back down. So it's a much more uh, discreet option, natural option compared to the malleable implant. Okay. Um, let's see what this one was. I think this might have just been the malleable device to show that off as well. Oh no, sorry, that's just replaying now. My my bad. Um, so that's sort of the erectile issues in a in a nutshell. Um, typically, you know, I'm switching gears over to the urinary issues. Typically, post prostatectomy, especially so after having the prostate taken out, men tend to recover their urinary control much faster compared to their erectile function. Um, really, the biggest thing that we worry about is something called stress urinary incontinence or SUI. Basically, it means bladder leakage. So if you think about the um, bladder as, you know, there's, there's an external sphincter. Basically it's a muscle that you learn how to control in toilet training. And when you don't want to urinate, that muscle is tight. It's, it's clenched and that prevents urine from leaking through it. And when you do want to urinate, you learn to relax that muscle to, to open up the urethra and allow urine to pass through. In the case of stress urinary incontinence, a patient can't stop urine from flowing out of their body when they're stressing that sphincter, whether it's with moving, like laughing, lifting, bending, et cetera. It strongly correlates with prostate cancer surgery. Up to 50% of men are going to report leakage immediately following surgery for prostate cancer. But most of the time that gets better. Um, patients will typically describe a short amount of time where they have to wear a pad or a diaper to keep themselves clean. But after, if we look at back at the one year mark after surgery, only about 15% still have some incontinence at that point. And that might be because of um, the prostate cancer surgery. It might be exacerbated by different neurologic disorders like multiple sclerosis or Parkinson's disease. It could be exacerbated by radiation that you need after your prostate cancer surgery to fully control the, um, to control the cancer, or could be a result of different pelvic traumas. Regardless, we know that we have a lot of different options. 
there are very conservative first line treatments like the pads and diapers that I mentioned that patients will use to keep themselves clean and dry. And those need to be changed several times throughout the day, depending on how much leakage you're having. Some patients find that wearing a condom catheter can be very, very helpful. So a condom catheter basically meaning there's a small bag attached to the leg that um, attaches up to a condom that sits on top of the penis. And that just catches the urine and it'll keep your underwear and your pants dry. Again, a closed system that the outside world doesn't have to see, but it does need to be emptied and changed routinely. Uh, the most common thing that I'm recommending to patients when they see me for rehab is pelvic floor physical therapy, which is really just Kegel exercises. So learning how to strengthen those pelvic floor muscles that sit like a hammock around your bladder. It's the same, just like doing bicep curls in the, in the, in the gym. The more you flex those muscles, the bulkier they become, and the more of a stopgap measure you can create before you leak. And you can see that there on the on the left-hand side of the screen, on um, those pelvic floor muscles, it really does live like a hammock around the prostate. And when we remove the prostate, we want to bulk up those muscles to help stop the urine. It almost acts like a speed bump. And then finally, Cunningham clamps. They're basically external devices. Um, they're foam. They're very soft. I know it looks like a torture device, but patients actually find them to be incredibly helpful um, when they're going through the rehabilitation program right after their prostatectomy. You can't wear these all the time, but patients will typically buy a Cunningham clamp and save it for if they're out running errands or out to a doctor's office, or if they're going to go out to like a nice dinner with their partner and you just don't want to deal with a diaper or a pad. Um, it basically uh, squishes the penis and helps to prevent urine from leaking through the urethra. It can stay on for about two to three hours. After that, I do recommend patients set a timer and go to the bathroom, take it off, urinate, empty their water, and also just give their penis a minute or two to breathe before they put it on in a different spot. But these are easily available through either insurance plans or even just on Amazon. It's pretty incredible what you can buy on there at this point in time. For the patient who goes through, you know, six months post pr uh, prostate cancer surgery, and we're finding that, you know, they still have that a little bit of leakage. So I call it mild to moderate. So let's say that they're using one to maybe two ish pads per day. They've maximized their pelvic floor physical therapy, but they just can't quite get to where they want to. That might be the ideal patient for a male sling. So think of it as another hammock in addition to your pelvic floor muscles to reposition and support the urethra. You know, after we take the prostate out, everything sort of just sags down. So by creating that hammock to lift it back up, it creates another speed bump. This is a really great option for certain patients because it's a same day operation. It's an immediate effect. It's gonna restore continence on its own. And you know, I'll never promise to a patient that I'm gonna get you bone dry, but we can get you pretty close, um, especially if you fit sort of that mild to moderate incontinence criteria. Um, it's really best for patients who didn't need pelvic radiation. So really they just had their prostate removed and they just wanna be a little bit drier. So, you know, we do this a lot at Robert Wood Johnson, um, and it can be a really great option. Typically, uh, it's the same sort of pre-op testing as the next option, which is the artificial urinary sphincter. I typically want to see patients in the office. We want to do something called a cystoscopy, which is a quick camera test. So we take a look at the urethra, check the anatomy, make sure there's not a lot of scar tissue, and then have patients do some coughing maneuvers to assess how much incontinence do you really have to make sure that we're giving you the appropriate options. For patients who have more incontinence than that, so let's say you're using more like two to four pads or even full on diapers per day, a sling is probably not gonna get you to your goal. It's probably not gonna make you close to being dry. And in this case, we may recommend more of the AUS or the artificial urethral sphincter. This is a little bit more of um, an investment for patients because it mimics a healthy urethral sphincter. If you remember, we talked a little bit about how the normal sphincter will squeeze shut when you want to be dry and it'll relax open when you want to urinate. So in this case, we're recreating that sphincter with a cuff. And you can see that cuff goes around the urethra. And when it's inflated, it squeezes the urethra and prevents urinary leakage to deflate that cuff, which you would have to do multiple times a day because we're gonna want you to urinate you know, four to six times per day to maintain a healthy bladder and kidney function. Um, patients have to squeeze the control pump, which lives inside the scrotum, and that pulls the fluid from the cuff, deflating it into a little balloon. That balloon again lives by the bladder. It's very similar to the IPPs. 
and the cuff will deflate and open and allow urine to drain through, but it automatically inflates from that pressure regulating balloon. So patients just have to squeeze that pump once. So you can see here on this video, uh, just an animation of what that really looks like. And again, everything is inside your body. No one is going to know that this is here, but you. Okay, so you can see the pump in the scrotum that's yellow and this patient's gonna push it. And that's gonna cycle fluid out of the cuff into that white pressure regulating balloon. And when the fluid leaves the cuff, the cuff opens. So you can see that happening in this little inset. And when it opens, it allows urine to drain right through. And then automatically after a minute or two, the fluid will, will cycle back from the balloon down into the pump cuff again. So we'll take a look at that one more time. You can see the urine flowing through as the cuff deflates. Okay. Very similar to the IPPs, this is a usually overnight stay in the hospital. Okay. Um, patients will experience just the, I, I counsel patients weigh in the same risks associated with an IPP versus an AUS. Low risk of infection, um, bleeding, needing, um, you know, having any kind of like injury done to surrounding organs, um, like the urethra, the bladder, the testicles, rectum, et cetera. Uh, typically patients will see me at two weeks, again, to make sure that they're healing well and do a check-in. And then at six weeks post-op, you're fully healed and that's when we can start activating the cuffs. In other words, you'll continue to leak after this operation for six weeks while we're waiting for everything to heal. But at six weeks post-op, you come back, we activate the cuff and Hopefully, if I've done my counseling right, your dry are pretty close to it. Um, very similar to the malleable and the inflatable penile prostheses, artificial urethral sphincters and slings are commonly covered by insurance plans. And when we look back at patients who have had these operations done, 90% say that they would do this operation again. Um, so, you know, it is a very satisfying operation, usually for patients as well as for me. I would say take home points for this brief overview or that. Urinary control, erectile issues, they're very normal after prostate cancer treatment, no matter which option you elect for. But know that there are a lot of effective treatment options. Um, and men really do their best when they when they can log into a dedicated rehabilitation program, which we offer here at CINJ. Um, I have offices at CINJ, so at the 195 Little Albany Street. I also see patients over in the Ruck in the New Brunswick's. Um, Robert Wood Johnson's side at the Clinical Academic Building. So either way, I'm happy to see you at either location. One small caveat is that I am going on maternity leave um, starting around Memorial Day, and I'll be back around Labor Day. So uh, if you call the office for an appointment and they tell you I'm not available to September, that, that's why. Um, but thank you. We look forward to taking any questions. Um, hello? Can you hear me? Yeah, yes. we can hear you. Hi, uh, Dr. Gomez. Um, I had um, both um, IMRT and proton radiation, and you didn't mention anything about proton. And the other thing is when I had my, um, oh, my biopsy, I came down with sepsis. I was in the hospital for six days. You didn't mention any of the risks. Um, was that on purpose? <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, it was kind of, uh, I wouldn't say it was on purpose. It was just kind of an overview. Obviously, there's a lot to cover in the realm of, you know, prostate cancer. Um, yeah, but just to kind of, you know, touch upon your, your two points there. Um, you know, I kind of lumped all of radiation into one category. Um, you know, mainly because the, the talk was a little bit more geared toward the screening side than the than the treatment side. Um, you know, so there are a lot of different forms of radiation. Um, you know, proton is is certainly one of the forms. I think the the thought process, though, and, and the way it's delivered and kind of potential side effects are, are pretty similar along the same end of the spectrum. So um, I kind of just lump, lump them all into one. 
Um, you know, as far as to your second point regarding the biopsy, yeah, that's a, I mean, that's a, that's a great point uh, to bring up. You know, historically, prostate, the biggest risk of prostate biopsy uh, was an infection, and about 1% of men undergoing the traditional, what's called transrectal ultrasound guided prostate uh, biopsy, do get sepsis. Um, unfortunately, the, you know, it's the way we access the rectum traditionally is, a, is an inherently dirty part of the body. Um, so the possibility of kind of introducing bacteria through the rectum into the urinary tract does exist. Um, you know, here at CINJ, though, actually, we've been embracing, you know, somewhat of a, a newer technique, um, especially an old technique that's kind of come very much back into favor. And that's a, a new approach to prostate cancer biopsies, which is called transperineal. Um, so as opposed to, you know, putting a needle through the rectum, which, again, is an inherent, inherently more dirty part of the body, you know, we've started accessing the prostate through the perineum, which is the area of skin um, in between basically the base of the scrotum and the rectum. Um, and so in doing that, we, you know, that approach, uh, it's a little bit more cumbersome. We've been doing them, you know, kind of in the operating room with a little bit of sedation as opposed to in the office, um, just because it's, you know, different positioning, things along those lines. But uh, that significantly reduces, if not the eliminates uh, what again is the main risk of a prostate biopsy, which would be a, a bad infection or even sepsis. So, thank you for your comments. Okay, um, we have another question. How do patients get um, referred to Dr. Velez, the surgeons? Um, I think probably if you call either of those numbers, the, the any of the 235 numbers, um, you should be able to make appointments with us. Uh, alternatively, you know, your primary care doctor, your oncologist, um, they can also always send over a referral to help facilitate that too. Yeah, I mean, I think within our system, you know, we, you know, often we work very hand in hand, um, you know, because unfortunately we know that you know, especially any, any treatment for prostate cancer is not without side effects. So, um, you know, kind of, it can be through your urologist or here, it's a very seamless process, but, you know, certainly you can, you know, see Dr. Velez, um, you know, either at your own accord, um, you know, with our contact provided. And I'll also, you know, emphasize too, that we see, I, I see patients for erectile issues and urinary incontinence issues who never had prostate cancer. Um, so certainly we know that it can be a, a higher incidence in men who've had prostate cancer and treatments, but I have plenty of patients who just have diabetes and despite all their best efforts to control it, they still have issues with the erection. So it's, it's not just for prostate cancer. Okay, we have how often should a 60s male get PSA done? No family history of prostate cancer. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, it's a very nuanced question. Um, you know, it, traditionally PSA screening, you know, in its truest and most aggressive form is, is once a year. Um, you know, but we've kind of fallen back on that a little bit you know, kind of with a better understanding of the disease and really understanding that what we're trying to really seek out and diagnose are more of these clinically significant or potentially lethal cancers, um, as opposed to just any little bit of prostate cancer. Um, so it really depends on, on what your numbers are and what your previous numbers have been. Um, you know, for example, if somebody has numbers that are, you know, you mentioned you know, in your 60s, say your numbers are in the free range, you know, which is normal, but, you know, upper limit of, you know, a little bit upper limit of normal, we might be doing them every year um, or every six months to a year. Um, however, if say you were six years old and you had a PSA and it was very low, say 0 0.5, for example, then you could probably not need another one for another about two to three years, um, you know, because that absolute number being so low is a very good predictor of, you know, lifetime risk of developing prostate cancer. So, you know, I would say basically anywhere from most likely one to three years, depending on uh, what your absolute number is and what your numbers have been about. Okay, we have another one. I heard that if I take more vitamin D, it can lower my PSA. Is that true? Are there other things I can do? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, I, I mentioned this before, a lot of the risk factors for prostate cancer, you can't control, you know, age, um, family history, genetic mutations, things along those lines. 
you know, pound for pound prostate cancer is not one of the more environmentally driven or risk fact, you know, where you can really modify other risk factors. Um, and it's unfortunately somewhat of a very new science in terms of trying to determine how some of these things might decrease your risk. Um, vitamin D is certainly something that has come into play, and there's some evidence to support that, you know, maintaining appropriate or even high vitamin D levels can decrease your risk of prostate cancer. Um, there is some evidence that things that are high in lycopenes, uh, so specifically tomatoes, so like uh, stewed tomatoes, things like that can decrease the risk of prostate cancer. Also, some of the um, vegetables such as broccoli and cauliflower as well. Um, again, somewhat of a loose science, um, but then otherwise, it's really just things that promote a healthy lifestyle. So stop smoking, um, exercise, and um, alcohol in, in moderation. Okay, we just have a few more. Um, what was the PSA normal average range again? Sure, um, somewhat of a tricky question because of, you know, again, there's, it varies based on, on age and uh, race and things like that. Um, I can, you know, but generally speaking, you know, men in their 40 to 50 range should be about less than two and a half. You know, men in their 50s should be about less than three and a half. Um, you know, men in their 60s or low 70s should be about less than four and a half. Um, but again, there are, you know, these, these statements all have to be taken a little bit with a grain of salt um, because, you know, like we talked about, one of the, you know, flaws of PSA is that it, it can be false negatives or false positives, um, but loose numbers to keep in mind there. Okay, and how long does the penile implant last? And there's actually a really great study that came out a few months ago um, that looked back at durations. And we found that at eight to 10 years after the implants going in, 85% of patients still had the same implant in place. So I'd say on average, eight to 10 years, it's sort of like a car. The harder you drive it, the earlier you'll need to replace it. Um, but replacement surgery is not as arduous as the actual placement surgery. So once we've created those spaces, um, when I do have, get to the point where patients have to have their implants replaced, they tolerate that very, very well. Okay, and could prostate cancer treatment affect my ability to have children? If so, should I talk with a fertility specialist before cancer treatment begins? Should I consider sperm banking? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that's another very common consult that I get for patients. So when we take your, if we do radiation to your prostate, uh, there's always going to be some scatter effect down to the testicles where you would make sperm. So we would recommend that you don't try to actively conceive a child within two years of radiation or, or chemotherapy. And that's just general um, recommendations for anybody who's getting any kind of cancer treatment, not just prostate cancer treatment. Um, so in that case, yes, yeah, so if you if you're thinking that you're one to want children within the next two years, you should sperm bank prior. Um, for the patients who have their prostates removed, so the majority of the, of your ejaculate of that semen, which is going to contain sperm um, for fertility, is actually comes from your prostate. So when you don't have a prostate anymore, you're not going to naturally ejaculate. And actually, when Dr. Columbus takes your prostate, he's also going to give you a vasectomy as part of that treatment. Um, so yes, absolutely. Patients should sperm bank prior. And that's another consult that I see commonly for patients is fertility preservation and, um, you know, prior to and after cancer treatments. Okay, great. And what foods or drinks should I avoid to lower my urinary incontinence? Yeah, there are definitely... Um, triggers that can change from patient to patient. So, but common ones are caffeine, um, teas, coffees, carbonated drinks, even just seltzer water. It doesn't have to be sodas, um, but juices, alcohol, things like that, that are going to make your bottle a little bit more irritable and, and give your bladder a harder time storing urine, um, which patients will often come to me and say, you know, I, I have terrible incontinence after I drink my coffee in the morning. And I'll say, well, Try not drinking the coffee for a few days and see if that changes the incontinence. Um, there, everybody has different trigger foods and drinks, but those are certainly the common ones. Okay, um, if there are any other questions, um, feel free to type it in the chat box. Um, just one more. Um, 
Um, I heard you can lose length after going through prostate cancer treatment. Is there a device that will help with length loss? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so certainly part of that p &L rehabilitation between the vacuum pumps and then also the medications that we give, the medications are going to help to bring blood flow down to the penis and keep that tissue healthy. Um, and even doing that in and of itself is going to help to preserve some penile length. Um, but the vacuum pumps also help to stretch, like mechanically stretch the tissue. And, and we find that when patients do that, they can help to protect or even regain some of the length after their prostate cancer treatment, whether it's radiation or um, or surgery. And I typically will recommend that patients do that for at least a few months before we even get to the point of implant, because it usually means that I can put a bigger implant in. Okay. Um, it doesn't seem like we have any other questions, but we do have two comments. Um, one person said, thank you. Great talks. Another one said, very informative, concise, and well-delivered. So thank you, Dr. Columbus and Dr. Velez for presenting today. Um, it was definitely great hearing you both speak. Um, and for anyone who would like to listen to this presentation again, we will have it. It is recorded, so it will be posted on the CIJ website. Um, so I don't know if any last words from the two providers? Uh, no, I mean, I, I want to thank everybody for tuning in. Um, you know, I think that one thing with, you know, prostate cancer um, and prostate cancer treatments and side effects is, you know, just be vocal about it. You know, um, you know, obviously these are delicate subjects to talk about both from a screening, you know, across the board from, you know, screening to detection to treatment, et cetera. So, um, you know, I think that, you know, as providers, we, when we treat it a lot, we certainly try to have a, a level of comfort in, in talking about it. And I think, you know, patients need to just kind of have the same approach where you don't want to leave any questions on the table or things like that, or, you know, so just, you know, being willing and, and open to having, you know, honest and uh, productive conversations helps everybody. Yeah, I totally, totally agree with that. Um, you know, thank you so much for spending an hour with us this afternoon. I hope that we see you in the office to talk about prostate cancer. And if you've already had treatment to talk about options for afterwards. Um, but I tell patients all the time, you know, this is, uh, it's totally up to you how important the side of like the, the side effects of treatment are is some patients that will come to me and say, you know what, like, we have other ways of being sexually intimate. I think that that's great. Um, but if the incontinence is bothering you, if you feel like there could be improvement, I can see you for that too. So just be open. Um, and if you don't already have a plug in to CINJ, you know, your primary care doctor, your outside urologist, oncologist, they can easily put in that referral and we can get you in. Okay, great. Again, thank you everyone for attending. Thank you, Dr. Columbus and Dr. Velez. Um, for everyone, um, after we get off this webinar, there will be a short survey um, to be completed, um, as well as another email will be sent tomorrow as well, um, just to help us with future events. And there will be a part two of this Men Health series over the summer. So we look forward to seeing everyone again. Thank you so much for joining. Yeah, have a great day. Bye. All right. All right thank you. Bye-bye.